drive one of these? When I purchased this, the direction said you had to be uh, over 16. And um, let's see if I can go over here. And then when you're 60 years old, you're not permitted to ride it anymore. So I only have a couple months left. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to have as much fun with this thing as I can uh, before I put it to rest. But anyway, it really helps. I have, a, I have a disease that's out there. And it's not called laziness. It's, uh, it's called Morton's Neuroma. And uh, you kids can't ride this thing, and uh, they've been begging to drive it. And, uh, so I've made some enemies with it as well. Uh, if you open your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'd like to share a message from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as Rick prayed, we're going to talk about the uh, resurrection of the body. We're talking about the future, what the future is going to behold for the Christian and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, really draws a picture for us of uh, what's going to happen to our bodies in the afterlife. So I want to share that. Share that. Uh, we'll be looking at verse 42 through 49, uh, but I want to start, it's not on the screen, just a few verses before that, just to give a little background on what Paul is talking about here uh, when he talks about, when he begins to uh, defend the resurrection of the body uh, for the Christian. And so let me start with those verses, and then we'll th- ask, God's for, ask God for help uh, as uh, we seek His will, as we read His Word. Verse 35 says this, But someone will say, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Paul says, Then you fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps, of wheat or something else. But God gives a body just as he wished, and to each the seed of the body of its own. Verse 42. So also in the resurrection of the dead, it is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last man, a life-giving spirit. Pray with me. So, Father, as we come into your presence... We recognize that you're the one who gives us our new body. But first, we are like the seed of a plant. The seed is different than that which it produces the plant. Like a corn kernel. Doesn't look like a stalk until it dies and then grows. Father Paul is explaining the same thing about our human bodies. We are only the seed of what we will be in the resurrection. So, Father, I pray now as we contemplate these things that you would open our hearts, that we would open our own ears to hear, that we may apply the word to our hearts. So, Father, be with us today. Thank you for Jesus. Without him, there would be no resurrection and hope of life. This is my prayer in Jesus' holy name. So, about a year and a half ago or so, John, Chuck, and myself decided we need to start exercising and uh, getting a little round around the edges and a little flabby here and there, and so we wanted to tighten up our muscles. So we started a walking program, and uh, also we went down to the Rascal Center, better known as the Pascal Center, and started uh, doing some treadmill and working out and everything. Well, during that time, I got a disease called Morton's Neuroma. Have you ever heard of that? I think the doc probably has heard of that. And uh, is there a picture up there of an ugly foot? Is it up there? And see, or is that? There it is. But anyway, neuroma is between the metatarsal bones, and it's a nerve that gets irritated, and uh, and it swells up uh, your foot on the bottom where your where your uh, ball of your foot is. And right now, and that's why I have that riding machine right there. There's there's puffiness or swelling. It feels like marble sometimes on the ball of your feet, and it never goes away. 
It is a permanent condition. And so, you know, obviously you start looking into it, say, how do you get this thing fixed? And uh, they have an operation where they cut your foot open, the top of your foot, and they go down about halfway, and supposedly that neuroma sticks out, and they cut it off. And uh, that's supposed to cure the problem. But then I found out as you do more research, it comes back within a year to some people. And so you're back where you started from. But the problem is when you start cutting on nerves, other problems can develop. And people have even had their toes atrophy and go underneath the other toe. So now you're walking on your own toes. And uh, that's no fun. And so, you know, I'm just tired of this body. It's just tearing me apart. Can you identify some of you? And it's just wearing us out. It's breaking down. You know, but everywhere you look today, people are trying to have perfect bodies. How about the Nutrisystem commercial? You know, Marie comes out and says, Hi, I'm Marie. Well, guess what? We all know who you are. But she's claiming now that you can lose 13 pounds and 7 inches around your waist in 7 days. Isn't that amazing? Cosmetics. Now they have, now they have creams you can put on your face and your wrinkles are supposed to disappear. Well, that's an all a lot of medicine on your face, isn't it? And uh, Chamonix Genucel. Have you heard of them? Chamonix Genucel? You ever heard of, raise your hand if you heard of them. A couple of you have. See, you guys aren't. Uh, Chamonix. Uh, Gen you sell from Chamonix. But anyway, it, it, it promises to take the bags from under your eyes. Now, I've been using it for a couple months now. And uh, can you see the difference? <laughs> you see, somebody in the back says, no, we can still see the bags under your eyes. But I, w- I was telling Cynthia, I said, what I think is the main ingredient for this bag stuff is a shrinking glue. Because it feels like they do tighten up. But... Uh, all kidding aside, uh, I use it and I think it's working a little bit. But the media, even the culture and the media, they're bombarding us with where she had these, we should all be uh, muscle bound like Colin and we should be runway uh, models. But listen to this the cosmetic procedures that are taking place today, it's a huge industry. For about five, in, for about uh, the last five or ten years, uh, its production and increase has gone up like five fold. And uh, listen to some of these statistics. This is just here for the uh, top five uh, surgery procedures. There's been over a million in America, 1,227,000. And uh, it starts with breast augmentations. There were t- uh, over 300,000 of them have been done in 2016. Uh, liposuction, uh, 300,000 of those operations. And uh, nose shaping, 230-some thousand nose shaping. And I always thought I'd like to have a more narrow nose. You ever like play with your nose a little bit, you know, and kind of suck in your nostrils and see what it looks like and try to hold it for a while? And it seems to me the real smart people have narrow noses. I, I don't know if that's true or not. But, uh, so, and then there's eyelid surgery, over 200,000 eyelid surgeries. Now, that can be practical, though, because uh, when you have Irish eyes like mine, your eyelids start shutting down your eyes. And believe it or not, it's darker than usual now. And uh, they have an operation where they can fix those lids. But over 200,000 eyelid surgeries, uh, facelifts. You know, this right here, you know, to lift that and try to lift everything up. 131 million operations here in the United States. And then they have the top five cosmetic. It's a minimally invasive procedures. Uh, Botox is the big one. Seven million uh, Botox uh, treatments in the United States. So soft tissue fillers. I had to look that one up. But the soft tissue fillers where, you know, you, get the, you don't like this little line right here when you smile or when you don't smile, it's still there after you finish smiling. They give you injections, and a lot of times they take fat from somewhere else and put it in there. And so that's the old fillers there. That's uh, three, three million of those were done uh, last year. Uh, chemical peels. You know, why couldn't they just call it um, the, the mask? You know, because you put this gel over your face, it dries up, and you pull it off. And, uh, and it claim, and ha- I'm not going to ask for raising hands how many people have done this, but it takes a lot of, pulls a lot of stuff out of your face is the idea. And then you have laser hair removal. And uh, that actually went down about 4%, so there must be something about that that's just not right. But over a million people have done the laser uh, hair removal. And then you have one, microdermabrasions. Okay, so that's simply another type of mask. It pulls off one layer of skin. So you have some nice, fresh skin when they're finished with you. But listen to this. Going under the knife to fix barley woes does not always work out doesn't always pay off. Researchers are saying now that 65% of the people who have gone under the knife had any kind of surgery wish they hadn't done it. 
Uh, there's serious nerve damage can take place. And uh, also, it cannot fix psychological causes. So as Christians, God is promising ultimately to give, this, give us a perfect body. Now, I know this is hard to imagine, unless you're one of those people who have a perfect body, that you'll be ageless and youthful. And you have a perfect relationship with God. And we wrestle with that so much. We'll be without sin and without guilt and without shame. And we won't walk around in, in condemnation. That will all be gone with a new body. The body will be suitable for heaven because flesh and blood cannot inherit heaven. The body will be undefiled. No longer, the, it'll, be, um, it'll defy gravity and defy the physical realm that we live in. It'll be perfect without infection, without decay, and without sin and disease. Janet, there won't be any lupus. It'll be gone. There won't be cancers. We deal with cancer so much, don't we? We hate to hear that word. But all that'll be gone and no longer in the new body. You know, man cannot stop the aging process. It's part of sin. Sin came into, into the body. It's a penalty. We cannot fix it. We can attempt to. You know, it feels good to feel good, doesn't it? And we should be fit. We should feel good. But pain is coming. And uh, how many have a lazy boy or something similar to it? Just a chair you like to relax in. Well, look, if you're in there more than 10 minutes, at least it happens with my body, it takes about five or six steps to get towards the kitchen just to straighten up and, and work out all the kinks. And uh, I, I'm done with it, aren't you? And it reminds me of that old song that Mick Jagger used to sing, and I'm sure he's singing it now. What a drag it is getting older. But here in chapter 15, Paul is genuinely talking about something that we lost in the garden, which is restored at the resurrection. Paul brings to our attention in this passage here four changes that will take, uh, that, that w- will take place both now and then. It's a contrast of two living bodies, the bodies we live in now, our present body, then the resurrection body. And the first is the contrast between the perishable and the imperishable. He says in verse 42b, it is sown, a perishable body is raised imperishable. Now this word perishable, the Greek meaning is, it's a body that's decaying. It is corrupted. It is in ruin. It's perishing. It's the result of sin. It's irreversible. We can't stop it, though we try desperately. But at your birth and your very existence, existence now, as we read earlier, Our body now is the seed that has to die in order to get the new body, the transformed body. And so for the Christian, we can see that this, it's going to be a a change. It's going to be us, but we're going to be different. It's going to be a better result, just like the seed. It doesn't do you much good until it grows into its plant and produces a fruit. And the word for imperishable, so we'll be raised imperishable is this word incorruptibility. And it's the idea that nothing will spoil this new body. Nothing at all to be under the power of God in our new existence. Unending existence. That's hard for us to capture, isn't it? An unending existence. Sometimes we don't like to think about it because of the misery we're in. But there'll be no misery. We'll be happy that we could live forever. I asked someone, how are you doing? They answered, I'm slowly falling apart, but I'm doing okay. And if we look around this room, we're a group of people, we're falling apart, aren't we? Even Kyle here, old's Kyle. And he has vertigo, don't you? That is no fun. He probably can't ride my Segway, okay? But see, disease is in the body, isn't it? Even when we're young. So some of you came with walking sticks, some in wheelchairs, uh, some with walkers. Uh, I'm going to Segway for crying out loud. I I don't like that thing. It's fun, but it's necessary. But some have... Um, uh, uh, concealed hearing aids. And uh, don't raise your hands when I go through these. Some of you have spectacles. And uh, some of you have eye uh, surgery uh, uh, done because of cataracts, but they put new lenses in. Isn't that nice? Why can't they do that now? We have to wait till we have good cataracts. But some have plastic knees, plastic hips, plastic so- uh, uh, soldier, shoulders. <laughs> we don't need plastic soldiers. But some of us, some people can be classified as bionic. They have so many things have been done to their body. Then we have dentures, implants, and bridges, right? Uh, bridges to nowhere. We color our hair, and some people don't have hair to color. So we're, we are falling apart, aren't we? 
We're just falling apart. And so the new body is different. He says it's raised imperishable. It never will decay. You know, people won't ask you in heaven, hey, uh, you're aging well. Things are looking good. You know, but down here you get a, bit, a, little, a little bit of white hair and people think you're 10 years older than you are. And uh, all through the years I've been in, have been uh, tempted to use Grecian formula. But one time I opened one of the bottles in the store and that stuff stank, so I said, no, I'm not going to do it. But have you ever, and we've all had these moments, when you're in a moment and it's just good, and you don't want to leave that moment, you want to hold on to it, you don't want the sun to go down, you want time to stop, it's just a moment, a precious moment. And um, when Judy and I went out to California, we went to the Redwoods and we, in the morning, and uh, we came out of the Redwoods, and we're sitting on this ledge, and there's a big beach below us, the Pacific Ocean, just as blue as can be. Rocks coming out of the ocean, uh, the God set in their place, uh, after Noah's flood, birds that we've never seen before, uh, uh, um, seals you know, out in the water, you know, and the water's glistening, and we're sitting up there and having lunch on the side, and the redwood trees are behind us. I mean, it was just one of those moments you just stay right here and just absorb it, bring it in. And uh, camping, how many people like camping? And uh, camping, you get out there, you know, have one of those days, it's just beautiful. And I like it just as the sun's going down because, you know, the campfire's coming and, and, and you're cooking marshmallows on the campfire and just telling stories and reminiscing. You just, you just want to stay in that moment, don't you? And, uh, but that's what's coming. It's hard for us to imagine. But in that new body, in that resurrected body, in that imperishable body, we're going to stay there. Jesus said when he sanctified the church, it says we'll have no spot or wrinkle. That's another thing about aging. How many spots you have now? I mean, they're just growing. So I went to the dermatologist, you know, and, and um, I'm saying, you know, why doesn't Kaiser pay for all the tags I have? I'm going to get rid of them. She goes, look, we can't pay for them, but it only costs you about 100 bucks. I said, does it matter how many you have? She said, no. And I started counting one day. I just don't want to count. But we're, but we're just we're getting older. But can you imagine? No more spot, no more wrinkle. It also says holy and without blemish. And that's freedom, isn't it? And that's what we have to look for. He's going to raise us, and we're going to have a perfect body. It may not be cut the way we think of perfection, but it's going to lose all of those impurities. Number two, contrast number two, it says it's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. That's verse 43. Sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. Dishonor means it's sown in disgrace. In shame, it's under this curse of sin. And we deal with this every day, don't we? We, we deal with the dishonoring of our body because of sin. And it just doesn't go away until we're in the grave. But it says it's raised glorious. And I really like the first definition of this word when you look it up in the original language. And it says that we'll be raised in a praiseworthy body. Now, we don't always feel praiseworthy, do we? And it's because of sin. It's because of the imperfection uh, in our body. It says we'll be raised praiseworthy. And the idea is it's the very highest state of our being. It's the highest potential that God had in mind for human beings. I was looking up the other day. You know, Noah didn't start building the ark until he was 500 years old. They think 500 years old, you're pretty shriveled up. But he was 500 years old when he began to build the ark. He lived 350 years after the flood. He was 950 years old. That was pretty glorious, wasn't it? And then uh, Ms. Civil, Ms. Civil Chef, is that what it is, George? Uh, he's the guy that lived 969 years old. Methuselah, Methuselah, that's who it was, Methuselah. The other guy was David's enemy. But, uh, he, so he lived 969 years. I'm thinking, why didn't they round it off? I like even numbers. How about 970 and uh, Judy probably liked the 969. She likes odd numbers. But think about it. Maybe we'll be able to use 100% of our brain. And look at the potential already of human beings. Imagine maybe having a capacity of 100% of your brain. And, um, and more importantly, be able to be innocent again and without sin. So all of us have come to the point in our life where we look in the mirror and we say, mirror, mirror on the wall, you've got to be kidding me. Sags, bags, tags, and no abs. <laughs> but there is a sense where the body is dishonoring. But God promises to raise it in glory. 
And if you think about it, we do dishonor God with our body. We use our hands to steal, our minds to fantasize, our lips to gossip, our tongues to lie. We use our eyes to envy. But in this life to come, God will take care of all of that. We'll no longer be servants to our passions and to our impulses that we have now. You know, most of us wish we had just a little bit more IQ. But the problem is with that is that we'll use it selfishly and we'll just leave God out. But in that glorious body, that knowledge and wisdom and humility will be married together in perfect harmony. And the sky's the limit to what the possibilities are for humankind in that state and in that world when God gives us the new heaven and the new earth. You know, I kind of think about it, you know, there's going to be no time limit, there's going to be no space limit to us. The ability to travel, the ability to be somewhere, the ability to have time on your side, 100% use of your brain. Wow, the ability of the human race will change when God makes that change. Maybe the universe itself becomes our backyard instead of us just gazing from, at it from down here. We just don't know. But he promises to raise our body in glory. Praiseworthy. Number three contrast. It's sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Verse 43b says it is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. The weakness here means feeble, diseased, sick with many infirmities. And look around us. We're weak spiritually. We're weak physically. Many things attack us. And um, we have to deal with them all the time. And it's generational as well. My family is hardening of the arteries. You know, a lot of the men have died of, of heart disease. And, uh, but also there's behaviors that are passed down. I'm ashamed of the behaviors that the men in my family pass down. And they just don't go away easy, do they? We're weak. We're weak in the flesh. We're weak spiritually. And then it says we're raised in power. It's the word force. And force comes with many ideas in our mind. Force. I think of a jet engine. Just force, you know. But I think about when Jesus uh, took care of the legion, the demonics. A force drove the demonics out that nothing else could drive out. Force. So he's going to raise us with power. It's miraculous power. This will probably sustain our bodies forever and ever. Hard to imagine, isn't it? But it's like youthfulness. Um, you know, uh, and, and you probably did this too. When you were younger, wasn't it neat to climb the highest tree? Just pick the highest tree and climb up the highest tree. No sweat. Just go, you know. And... Um, and how about running? Uh, running like the wind. Remember you can run with the wind? Wind's blowing. You, you catch up with the wind. You ever do that? Yeah, youthfulness. I remember coming out of school, and uh, our school was really close to the, uh, it put it this way, it was shouting distance of my father when he said, come home for supper. So I played basketball after school. I could do that. And sometimes we'd be out there in the heat and on that asphalt for hours. It seemed like the body never ran out of energy. And so it's going to be raised in power. Have you ever noticed that everyone wants to live longer, but nobody wants to get old? Isn't that true? Somebody said it like this, growing old is no fun. And I'm going to quote Mr. Joe Gibbs. He says, getting old isn't for sissies. <laughs> have you heard the five B's of middle age? I'm sure you have. Balding, bifocals, bridges, bulges, and bunions. Man, I hate those words, don't you? You see, we, drag, we brag about our strength, but a tiny microbe can kill us. About two Sundays ago, I had some bad seafood. I don't know if it was, it was the uh, crab soup, it was a cream of crab, or if it was a shrimp salad sandwich. But I'm telling you, I almost passed out. You ever almost passed out from food poisoning? And uh, you're, it, took, it took a couple of days for me to recover from that. Jesus in the garden comes back to the apostles. They couldn't stay awake. He said, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. We just lose to sin too often, don't we? But we're just weak. But in contrast to this weakness, he's promising that the body in the resurrection will be miraculous. Now, Paul says this. He, too, addressed the resurrection issue with those in, in the Thessalonian church. And he told them, here's what's going to happen. In verse 17 of chapter 4, he says, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. Those who fell asleep and have gone before us are already with Jesus. They come back with Him. But if we're alive, we're taken off. And we're going to meet Him in the air. Now that's power, isn't it? Can you imagine that? 
in this body, I don't want to be more than four foot off the ground, do you? But can you imagine lifting up, having that transformation at that moment? It really is hard, isn't it, in our minds to pick that up. But by faith, the Bible's telling us these things. And God wants us to know them. He wants us to embrace them. Think for a moment about Lazarus. In Luke chapter 16, poor, wretched, hungry, deserted by man. The rich man wouldn't let the crumbs fall off the table so he could eat. And then in that moment, in that death, imagine the feeling he had when the angels bore him up and took him to Abraham's bosom, which is comfort, isn't it? Can you imagine for a moment, instantly the starvation gone, instantly lupus gone, instantly cancer gone, instantly bad heart gone, instantly. That's powerful, isn't it? That's a moment. God will raise it in this way. You know, we probably won't be like Superman. I like Thor. Man, the monsters can beat him to nothing and no scratches. It won't be like that, but listen to this. Nothing will kill the human body in the resurrection. I'll take that over Superman. Contrast number four, natural versus the spiritual. Verse 44 tells us it is sown a natural body, so we live in now, but it is raised a spiritual body. The natural body simply means it's a lower state. It's physical. But yet we put so much time into it, so much effort into it. And God says it's the lower state, the natural state. But it is raised spiritual. And this is supernatural. And it is to us because it's beyond our realm. But the resurrection body will be spiritual, but not like a ghost or not transparent. Notice what it says in John, 1 John 3, 2, that should be on your screen. Listen to this. John encourages us, and here's what he says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not appeared yet to what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, like Jesus, because we will see Him just as He is. So we don't know what we'll be. This is all speculation. This is all wondering. This is all taking evidence that we have in the Bible, which isn't a lot about the afterlife. And so we won't know until we see Him. But when we see Him, it's instantaneous because then we're changed. We see Him. Oh, we're like Him now. You see what John's saying? But it is our hope, isn't it? It's what we look forward to. I want out of this body, don't you? I don't want to invest in it any more than I have to. Because it's just in vain. We just got to be healthy to be useful to God. So we don't know yet, but we know we'll be like Him. The res- resurrection body is the same, but different. That sort of doesn't make sense, but it does make sense, doesn't it? It's like the corn kernel. We know what's going to come out of it when it's planted. We know that when we resurrect, it's going to be us, but it's going to be different. And it's going to be better. And it's going to be powerful. It's going to be miraculous. And sometimes that's hard for us to swallow, but it is. But here's some of the things, properties. If we're going to be like Jesus, here's some of the things that he had. And you know about this. You've read your Bible. He did have a bodily resurrection. He was in the body. He says this himself in Luke 24, 39. He says, see my hands. See, it's me, myself. Touch me, see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see that I have. It was a bodily resurrection. Jesus was in the body. He was able to eat in the risen body. He says these words in 2441. While they still could not believe it because if they're filled with joy and amazement, in other words, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. They were overjoyed that first that he was there. And they said, peace be with your hearts. And I'm sure it was. They were so amazed that just they didn't realize what was going on until he said, you have anything to eat? (laughs) You have anything to eat? Wow. What a moment with Jesus. But yet his body was different because he could appear and disappear and pass right through solid walls. Listen to what it says in John 20, verse 19. So then when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, And when the doors were shut, what's that mean? Nobody's getting in, right? Doors were shut. 
Where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. So Jesus could appear also in a different form. In Luke 16, 12, notice what it says. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along a way into the country. Jesus could ascend through the atmosphere directly into heaven in bodily form. It says that in Luke 24, 51, while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. We're going to have a perfect body, but not perfect the way we think it's going to be perfect. It'll be the same, but it will be different. It'll be a mystery. We do not know what we will be, but we will be like him, imperishable, glorious, powerful. Remember J.J., dynamite? That's what it's going to be. But it's going to be spiritual as well. You know, now we fight to be spiritual, don't we? We have to work at being spiritual. But it's going to be a spiritual body completely. Listen to this in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For we are citizens of heaven. You know that's in the present? We now are citizens of heaven. It's so easy to get caught up in our citizenship here, isn't it? Especially with our political atmosphere the way it is, it just makes you sick in the stomach if you let it, doesn't it? But listen, as a Christian, our citizenship is heaven, not here. Temporary. Don't let it get you so down that you lose the joy of your salvation. We are citizens now in heaven. From which also we eagerly wait for a Savior. You're waiting for Jesus? I just don't know if we are. I think maybe we're waiting for the next show or the next movie or the next meal or the next restaurant. Am I wrong? It's so easy to get caught up in the attractions of this present society. And we forget what God has in store for us. Are we waiting for Jesus? Or do we believe like the skeptics there in 2 Peter chapter 3 where they say, oh, where is He? Since the fathers are asleep and they're dead, where is He? Man, if we cop that attitude, then we're really not waiting, are we? But he says there we're eagerly waiting for the Savior of the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform. And the idea is a change, a quick change of the body, of our humble state. It is humble, isn't it? And you may not know it now, but keep getting older, you will be humbled, right? And the body of our humble state into the conformity with the body of His glory. Jesus' glory. By the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Remember all the things that Jesus did? He manipulated creation, didn't he? Matter of fact, John says nothing's created without him. All things are created through him and for him. So he is able at that moment to exert a power that gives you a new body. Now that's my Lord. That's my Savior. Our bodies will be conformed to his glorious likeness. Prepared in the moment for heavenly citizenship. I like that. But hear me out this morning. To get a perfect body, you have to be a citizen now. You follow me? you got to be in now. And so many folks are either waiting to the, for the end, their end of their life, but you don't know when it's coming, do you? You don't know. Nobody knows their time, do they? But it can come. Look again in your Bibles to chapter 15, 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read a few verses here. Verses 50 through 58. This is the rest of the story. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But, with the, but we'll all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will rise imperishable and we'll be changed. And that's a moment, isn't it? Are you waiting for that? Are you listening for the trumpet? Are you waiting for it to sound? And, uh, you know, the first instrument I played in elementary school was a trumpet. And here's the only reason why, because I like Herb Albert and the Tia Winter Brass. Some of you remember him. Ba, 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 ba. That's the only hit he ever had. But there's a trumpet, and it's going to sound. 
It's going to be a blast that the whole world will hear. And it says in that moment, a change will take place. Faster than you can twinkle your eye. And if you're in the body, it will be changed according to God's power. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and the immortal will have, and the mortal will have put on the immort, immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And so whatever pain you're in, whatever disease is going to grab a hold of your body, or maybe it already has, he's saying the victory in Jesus nullifies all that pain, all that decay, and all that getting old. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God that he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is for the whole church. You can't end it better than the Apostle Paul. Therefore, my brethren, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our tool is not in vain in the Lord. We're citizens now, if you're a Christian. And in that citizenship, there's a great expectation that not only we wait for the Lord's return, that last trumpet for our new body, but that we be, be involved in building this kingdom because don't we want our loved ones to have this? Don't we want our friends and our neighbors and those because you were lost at one time and somebody took the time to tell you that there's a great expectation of a glorious body, a glorious time, a glorious realm when all this sickness of this world is gone and you don't have to hold on to it anymore. That's what he wants us to have. So the call is to the Christian, let's get working. Rid ourselves of the world and its pull and its citizenship and what it offers. Can it offer what God offers today? Not even close. But it depends on our mindset. So today, here's an opportunity as we uh, bring up the band as we come, as we prepare ourselves uh, for offering time. It's also a time to make a decision uh, to be a part of the citizenship of uh, the kingdom of God. He wants us to do that. You know, uh, Joe is... Uh, as much as uh, I have fun on that Segway, I don't like that thing. And I know you can't, get rid of, can't wait to get rid of your walker, can you? But you know, you know what's worse? Knowing that you'll miss the new body that God offers. That's worse. Because we know that sooner or later this body is just going to give out, isn't it? Or old what's his name, Oon over there in North Korea is going to send a missile over here and start burning people up. We don't know, do we? Anything. This is something to contemplate, to get ready for. So before I pray for the offering, it's an opportunity to come forward, and then after our communion time, we'll baptize you into being a citizen of the kingdom and look forward to that new body that God's offering us. Father, while we can't outgive you, we just can't do it. But Father, we have something to give to. And that's a kingdom without end. Though we are in the physical body, and you give us the ability to labor, and you said labor is a reward, we can give to something that's eternal. To bring lost souls into your fold. To give the hope of eternal life when this body is done, or when something snuffs it out. So, Father, would you bless the offering that builds the kingdom? May we build it together in the unity of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name that I pray. Amen.